Um, let's see if it works now. Oh, OK, very good. So um, Todd Goldfinger, I'm um, a mental health advocate, musician, all that stuff. And I'm very, very proud and very so I, I, I the words can't describe this because I mean, if you can see what's what's sitting next to me is like what I had for my childhood, <laughs> you know, yeah, 15 years old, you know. I took the sure. prices off because I don't want you to know how much I, I, I bought this book at the time. <laughs> it was probably a few pennies, I suspect. <laughs> I'm not selling it, by the way. It's not for no. this. Everybody on the internet who's watching, if they watch this, please d don't bother me. This is, I'm keeping it forever. I love it. Mwah. It's the best. <laughs> All three of them. Yeah, cool. Excellent. And, you know, I'm going to ask you, you know, of course, about Max Norman and things like that, maybe. Yeah. Okay, so how do we get started? Um, you are Steve Grimmett from the legendary band Praying Mantis. No, 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 no sorry. Uh, uh, Grim Reaper. How are you? Fucking great! <laughs> uh, yeah, me too, actually. Yeah. <laughs> me too. Even though we're in isolation, I'm good. It's so, it's so good to see you and to get to talk to you and to see your hair. And, um, you know, all these things, you know. Cool. Cool. Okay, so the first question I have for you, Mr. Grimmett, Steve, yes. is where did you grow up and how did you get into music? Uh, well, I grew up in um, the outskirts of London. Um, my parents were, uh, well, especially my dad was actually born in London. Uh and um then we were we we and we, we we were in a place called chesham in amersham buckinghamshire which is just outside london and then um we were going to move to australia and or emigrate i should say and uh Good my mum's <laughs> yeah yeah my <laughs> mum's uh my mum's family didn't want us to move so my dad says okay well look find me a business and you know i'll think about it and if i like it i'll we'll stay so that's exactly what they did and we ended up moving uh slightly closer to london uh in a place called walton on thames and uh my father was a news agent and uh, basically that's what we did for for about another further eight years and then i was 15 and we moved to a place called tewkesbury in gloucestershire which is a very very famous uh town a historical town and uh that's where i did the, the final stages of my schooling and first girlfriend and stuff like that and she caught me singing in the bedroom and she says you're really good you know and, and uh i said oh yeah 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 but lo and behold, she'd gotten me a job. Uh, well, not a job, but she'd, she'd got me a, um, an audition with a local band. And basically, I got the job. And that's when it all started. You know, it was we did um, uh, over here. We had the uh, uh, cinema um, chain called uh, abc cinemas and they used to have a saturday morning uh, for the kids and uh, we played a show there and that was it for me that's it was in my blood and away we went yeah excellent was that band called chateau nope i was never in the band chateau uh, they asked me to do a single for them which I did, no problem at all. And because um, they were, well, two of them were really good friends of mine. The other two I didn't know. But um, so I went and did that. And that was with Ebony Records. And in between doing that single and me doing the album, where a Grim Reaper had won a, um, uh, a competition where we won... 24 hours in a 24 track studio so we did we did a demo basically and i took that demo with me when i went to do the album for chateau sure and six weeks later we were signed and that was you know it was like bang here we go but um yeah chateau was was me doing the fa a, a favor to the band because they didn't have a singer at the time and couldn't find one but they were uh 
and obviously struggling to find one um, to do the the single and the and the album. So that's what I, I ended up doing. That so that was the only one I did, and it was a, a pure favour for the guys. Did that open things up for you? Uh, yeah, in a way, because it got me uh, access to Ebony Records, and uh, it was. <sighs> It was the very first time I'd done a, an, an album in a 24-track studio. So, yes, it was, it was good for me. Uh, it was a good experience, let's say. Um, and then, obviously, it gave me the opportunity to give our demo to, to, the, to Ebony Records, and, and that's where we went. That's, that's how it all started. The rest is history. It is. True heavy metal history. Yes, and what year was that around that you um, had that? I think that was 90, either 81 or 82. I can't remember, to be perfectly honest it's with okay. you. It's okay. But, but around it's, the... it's around that sort of time, yeah. Sure, sure. Because, because this, this album, this, this uh, yeah. not See No Evil, but See You in Hell, yes. uh, is, uh, or Fear No Evil or anything like that, um, which is the second album. Yeah. Uh, this one came out, I believe, in 1983, it says here. Yeah. Yeah. And... Uh, all the songs were written by Nick Balcott and Steve Grimmett. That's right. That's right. A so it was like, vibration, I would have to say. Yeah, I mean, all those songs were written before uh, we ever got the deal. So um, it was uh, it was a question of going up there, recording it, and and that was it. it uh, that was actually recorded in four days um wow. with overdub so it was done in four days i can't remember how long it it was uh to mix but probably not a lot longer than that and uh yeah that was quite a surprise because when it came out it went absolutely mental in uh europe and how it got to the states or we ended up uh being uh signed by rca in america was um it had gotten to a, a shop, a, a record store in New York called Zigzag Records, and they took it to a guy called Walter O'Brien, and he really liked it. He wanted to sign it. Uh, he owned Combat Records at the time, mm -hmm. and he wanted to sign it, but Ebony Records didn't want to uh, 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 another independent to sign it. He wanted a major label. So Walter took it to Wendy Goldstein at RCA, um, and then bang, away that went. So it was wow, just, wow. It was, and that was it. It was just you know, being at the at the right time or in the right place at the right time, you know, and uh, that's how it happened. Right, right, because it wasn't it wasn't so easy for other bands like like uh, like Praying Mantis, for example. You know, some some of them. No, you know? no exactly. And uh, and what helped was. Uh, um, See You in Hell video was uh, put on by MTV and it was only ever going to be played once and they put a questionnaire after it to say do you want to see more of this kind of stuff and the response was immense yeah. and so they, they ended up putting us on maximum rotation so that was seven days uh, seven weeks every day of the week for seven times a day it was absolutely the perfect stepping stone for us absolutely and in its heyday in 1983 mtv was really i would have to say at its peak as far as doing what it's supposed to be doing as a music yeah network. yeah it was yeah definitely and uh, maybe for a few years after that they were they were the place to be i mean that was even being shown in the uk so mm -hmm. it was uh, it was good you know it was really good and then like like everything, like all the radio stations out there, they chose to do other things, you know, do top 40 stuff. And it was just like, oh, yeah, you know, you've, I, you've, you've just ruined it. This was sort of like the subculture at the time. Yeah. Like our yeah. subculture. Yes, I mean, it yeah. was. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it definitely was. There wasn't a place we couldn't go without being recognized because of MTV. You know, that was, uh, it was phenomenal. So you, you felt good about that, getting all this, uh, because I, I would imagine for some people it's very difficult. Like for Paul Diano, the success was very hard. But for you, it was like you really, I, for lack of better terms, you really hammed it up, which is great. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I, was, it, I can't really say what, you know, 
what the golden rule was then, but it just worked, you know, and and uh, it, I, you know, yeah, I, I see a lot of, of, uh, of famous people, you know, saying, oh, yeah, I used to jam to Grim Reaper, and we're talking yeah. about, you know, it's like, <laughs> really? You know, so it was it was great. And, and the amount of adulation I get from fans on on social media is like, oh, yeah, you're my inspiration. You did that. Da, 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 da. It was it, it's phenomenal, really. So it's far more than just getting your band up there and doing stuff. It meant it means an awful lot more to me than just that. You know, uh, it seems I've helped a lot of people and I've helped a lot of people out of a, out of dark places with with my music. Out of a depression. Yeah. 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 It's fantastic. I know that it certainly helped me when I was 15 years old and, you know, uh, you know, in my room playing bass all day and learning every single Iron Maiden song, yeah. uh, you know, by heart and, mm. you know, also playing along. I have my bass right there. Uh, it's that uh, I would be playing along to like see you in hell, like but but I'll do it with like harmonies and stuff, like dun 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 bum 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 dun 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 all that. <laughs> so good, such a nice shuffle. <laughs> you can dance to it actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. It gives a lot of people so much joy, and it, you know it's, it's funny that you mentioned about the depression because this this album, See You in Hell, it feels very melancholy in, in some places, like guitar wise. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I mean, that's it. We, we wrote stuff for the way we wanted it at the time because we didn't really understand the linking between us and the fans and stuff. So pretty much the first and second album were written and always written for us with nothing else in mind other than, oh, this is a good song. This is a good hook. This is a good riff. Let's mm -hmm. just do it, you know. Um, and we were we were seen as uh, as the devil's child as well, you know, oh, in yeah. the States. And, um, many, and many it, at the time. Uh, and it was just like, well, it got nothing to do with that at all. Grim Reaper, A, is a, is a character from the Revelations in the Bible. He's one of the four horsemen. So, and that's as far as, as it went for, for us. Second, mm -hmm. it lends itself to great artwork. And that, and that is as far as it went. And the songs were basically uh, sort of three and a half, four minute songs uh, in the shape of uh, Hammer House of Horrors. Yeah, it, it has was, that feeling. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's all it was. You know, it wasn't anything about the devil. It wasn't. And, I, and I've had interviews with, and I say that. And they say, well, what about Dead on Arrival? And I said, have you read the lyrics? Uh, well, no. No, well, it's about a friend of mine who got killed on a freeway in the UK. That's it. And and what about See You in Hell? Well, See You in Hell, that is a story about the, tempta the first temptation of Christ. So, yeah, it was, they were wild times. <laughs> yeah, with the PMRC and the, the yep. labels, the explicit lyrics and things like that, which I really couldn't understand. No, fully. no, I don't either. And apparently uh, one of my... Um, uh, Facebook friends said that her preacher was going to start up a um, uh, uh, lawsuit against us for, for preaching the devil and all that sort of stuff. But it didn't come to anything because uh, Judas Priest and uh, uh, Black Sabbath had won their cases. So uh, he, he dropped it. But yeah, so we were the next in line for that for that stuff you guys were one of the targets yeah 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 but what for i don't you know well they, they we, know what, we know what for we understand we get yeah. it we get steve yeah. we get it because these were a lot of board housewives which was actually being run by tipper gore who was a frustrated drummer that's it yeah there you go yeah who could yeah who couldn't make it as a musician and what happened yeah. when you can't make it a musician you know yeah. it's, it's like the elvis song you know it's like uh they uh in the ghetto when they uh you know uh i forget the rest of the lyrics anyway it's yeah like, too much of this anyway yeah, yeah exactly yeah yeah <laughs> yeah i know it's it's crazy but there you go yeah it's it's true and so speaking about explicit lyrics there's a song here that i have i printed out the lyrics especially mm -hmm. you and it's called 
suck it and see. What is that about? What is it? How did it happen? <laughs> well, again, that's, that's kind of a double entendre. Um, suck it and see in the UK is a, is a saying. Okay. And what it means is, okay, well, let's give it a go and see if it works. So, yeah. okay, let's suck it and see. Ah, yeah. okay. okay, that's great. Okay, yeah. good. But, but I've I've sort of like turned it into double entendre because uh, it's a kind of a story about uh, me and my babysitter, go, you know, going way, way back. So it's, it, that's what it's about. That sounds good because, I mean, I, this, this is why they gave you the explicit lyrics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? Because of this song. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because they're thinking all in a, in a what, what, if, if you don't mind, if I can read no, the lyrics. No. So this lady in black came to me and she said, would you like to come home to my room? I resisted all temptation, but I took her invitation. I hope that she doesn't make me fall too soon. Yeah. She said, suck it and see. It was all new to me. All in a young child's dream. Now that's where yeah. I think they had a problem. They had a problem with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I get, I, I, I get it, it. It borders on, you know. Yeah, on, yeah, yeah, yeah. She said, "Suck it and see." Can't be happening to me, but it's good if you know what I mean. Suck it and see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know just, we resisted playing that for a long, long time, and then and then going out as Steve Grimmett's Grim Reaper. Uh, there was a few songs that, that we didn't do, but we kept being asked to do. And uh, uh, there was Dead on Arrival, which we put in a set now. And uh, what was the other one? Oh, uh, The Show Must Go On, The, the oh, Ballad. Yes. And uh, and Suck It and See. And uh, it was like, as soon as I introduce it, everybody goes mental. And it's like, okay, so it's, it's worth doing. And uh, people love it. Hello. And they're singing back at me, so it's cool. It's a, it's a really funny song, and I love this about this the, the album. Um, we're gonna talk about it now. Rock you to hell. Rock you to hell. Yeah. Rock you to hell, which has you on the back, sort of looking like um, you have a haircut that's very impressive here. This is this yeah. is really this is a work of art. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Queen's like had some interesting things, but this is really something else. Yeah, yeah. The hair is like. Um, it can't be described, but it, it, it does pertain to a certain point in time. Yep. And you had frills. Yeah. It's all good. Uh, yeah. it, was, it was produced by Max Norman. Yeah. For On Your Bike, which he did so many different things. Loudness, Ozzy, yeah. Dirty Looks, uh, who else? Everybody. Yeah. And, and including the great Grim Reaper. But there's no bass player in the back. No, there isn't. And the reason that they're... By the time we'd finished the album, Dave uh, didn't live up to our expectations. Dave Wanklin. Uh, yeah. So um, we had to let him go. And uh, that's why there's no picture of, of him on the album. Um, it's all a bit shitty. And, okay. Uh, but I'm still, I'm still, you know, we did the same with Lee. Lee sure. Harris at the start. You know, Lee was on the first album and that's all he did unfortunately but um yeah they, they were uh real tough times to deal with for me anyway but i'm still really good friends with the guys uh i i see dave on a fairly regular basis i see um lee on a probably slightly less um basis but i still see them and i talk to them on facebook and all the rest of it Mm -hmm. so uh yeah i'm still good friends with them and uh yeah as well as nick you know so um oh yeah nick is outstanding yeah, yeah. so you know it's all it's all it's all good it just i wish that had never happened because we are a really tight unit to start with uh and and you know but you know that's water under the bridge now so it's, sure uh, yeah. which brings brings me to this honorable mention that i definitely have to have to mention to you, this Heaven and Hell cover is yep. outstanding. It is amazing. It is so good. We've watched it so many times. I sat here because, you know, under lockdown, I, I came back from yep. from abroad overseas and, you know, I've been spending time with my family now, and which is great. And um, we've been watching these videos on the smart TV. I put it from my phone mm -hmm. onto the TV. Yeah. And we put on 
is Heaven and Hell with Steve Steen, Nick Bocott, yourself, uh, bass player. Uh, the name wasn't in there. Um, uh, that's Brian. Oh, do you know what? Forget his surname. So Brian. <laughs> Yeah, Brian is is the bass player, and uh, Joel's uh, Stephen Ett is on drums. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Lots and, uh, of yeah, lots of Steves. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it's it's good. It was it was a lot of fun, and um, and still is a lot of fun. We're just c completing another one. Uh, I probably won't be ready for about another ten days because Steve Stein's gone on holiday. Mm -hmm. um, but. Uh, yeah, it's it's that the, the the next one is looking really good. Um, That's chosen good. by me, <laughs> but yeah. What was that? I said that the next one is chosen by me, but uh, I won't I won't spoil it by telling you what it is. But uh, Joel uh, was in the studio yesterday, laying down another two drums, another two songs in drums. So uh, we've got another three to come, you know, including the one we're nearly finished. So uh, it's just great fun. So good because we love it. We yeah. here, here, me and my family. We've watched this video. I said, I said, this is going to be who I'm going to be interviewing. Watch this. This is this is awesome. This yeah. is him now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's great. It was great. I mean, we it we uh, well, three of three of the guys are in the states. So mm -hmm. Steve is. Midwest somewhere, and I think I think Nick is as well, but uh, but they're still miles apart from any any of it. Um, I don't know whether the other two, where the other two come from. And I'm in the UK, you know, mm -hmm. um, it's all done by computer. So uh, and then we video ourselves doing it, and uh, that's the only thing we don't mix is the is the um, the recordings, the, the 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 videos. We don't do that. Somebody else does that. That's great because it it looks great and it sounds great. Yeah, and I think it yeah, represents it represents everyone really well in what they do. Yeah. I mean, the funny thing is, you know, you you look at uh, Judas Priest, Rob Holford, and all the rest of it. They can't come anywhere close to the amount of, of views that we've had on that. I mean, I I should think it's around four hundred eighty five thousand views at the moment. Mm -hmm. That's unbelievable unbelievable awesome yeah totally awesome yeah i don't know whether that will happen again but we, we'll see well the 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 consensus you know the, the word on the street is more of that yeah yeah it is and we've we've picked a we've ticked three different bands well there'd be four altogether but we've picked three different ones because we don't want to uh, as, as much as I love Dio, I don't think it's a good idea to stick with just just him. And I and I think we've done him proud with that one. And uh, hang on a second, I'm just going to ask my wife for another <laughs> cup of tea. She's absolutely <laughs> lovely, by the way. I saw some videos where she, what you're such a, a, a blessed blessed per, very everyone should have a partner as wonderful as as Millie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, she's she's great. She really is, and uh, we've uh, she's been recovering furniture today, chairs. Uh -huh. So she's turned well. No, she's good with material and stuff. She uh, she she she's a a seamstress, I'd say. But then she can do plumbing. Uh, the only thing I won't let her touch is electrics. <laughs> but she, she makes she makes wonderful tea. I gotta say. Good. Well, she's British, right? <laughs> Yeah, she is. Yeah, 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 she is. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it's good because she she managed me for a while. Uh, basically, when I, I sort of came back with Steve Grimmett's Grim Reaper, she managed me for a few years and she did really well. But it got to a point where, you know, it, 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 she couldn't really take us any further. But uh, or, and uh it was just too much for her, you know. It, it, the whole thing had exploded, sure. so uh, I I sort of do it now at the moment. I can't get anybody to manage us. I don't understand why. I really do not. But there you go. It's uh, it's just something I have to do for myself. So I do. And at these times, like like now, it's probably um, 
well, there's there's no place that anyone can play right now because of this, no. uh, this the virus, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, people have to adhere to that still. Yeah, they do. And I, I, got, I was set to do a tour at the end of August, um, but we can't, well, we, we've postponed it. Uh, we did that, it was a good month ago, I think. Um, because at the time it was it was looking that I'd be coming over there, but uh, no. So and and I have to think about my my uh, health too because I'm diabetic, and um, uh, that makes my uh, immune system not as good as everybody. So it was a question of I've I've got to keep safe, otherwise I won't be able to keep doing this. You know, so. Uh, I've stayed indoors. I haven't been out much, um, and and if we do, it's all social distancing. You know, it's just a, a walk around the block. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if you don't mind me asking, you you mentioned that you have uh, diabetes. I, I looked yep. it up. It's a type two diabetes. Is, yep. that, is that correct? That's right. It and kind of runs in the family. Ah, that's what I heard because I, I know that my mom has type 1. Yeah, type 1 is a much more serious problem than type 2. Uh, type 2 is really, really difficult to keep under control. It, a lot of things affect it. But my grandfather was diabetic. Uh, my father is diabetic. My, uh, and I'm diabetic. No, it missed it missed. The, my other siblings it missed their mem but i think my daughter is getting it because she's uh she's actually in hospital at the moment producing my my um uh, another grandchild for me oh okay. as, <laughs> as we speak <laughs> so uh, but every time she gets pregnant she she gets uh, gestational diabetes and uh, so we think that she'll probably end up with uh, being type 2 as well so you know, later on in life, but uh, yeah. So I think you know more or less it, it's uh, a thing that uh, is hereditary. Mm -hmm. What are some of the warning signs to look for? Some of the symptoms. I, I could, do you know what I couldn't tell you because <laughs> because all I uh, all that kept happening to me was I kept getting urinary tract infections, and uh, I'd go to the to the doctors and they'd give me antibiotics and it it would sort the problem and then it, it came back and, and I was like it was a weekend so I couldn't get in to see the doctor so I thought I'm going to go and put myself in it A&E because there's, there's something underlying here so they, they had me in checked me over for an hour and he said well I can't really find anything wrong with you and I'm like <laughs> I, I'm telling you, there is, you know, because my stomach is killing me. He said, is there any other symptoms that you've got with this? I said, well, the only thing I think of is that my urine really smells. And he went, ah, right. <laughs> Tested me. And he said, you're diabetic. You need to go and see your doctor straight away. You know, so it's like, OK, Monday morning, I phoned up. So let, I've been told I'm diabetic. I need to come in. And they had me in straight away. And uh, yes, I was, I was, uh, uh, I was diabetic, so they. Uh, I've been. That's probably about fourteen or fifteen years now. Um, and uh, who is it? Might yeah, yeah, it is around there. And uh, it's it it's it's not a major pain in the ass, but it's it's a pain. You know, sure, having can. to t having to take drugs, having to shoot up every day, twice a day, and all that sort of thing because mine. It is really difficult to control, so I have to use insulin as well. So, uh, but yeah, it's but it's okay. I'm still alive. You know? You're still alive. God bless you. And you know, like, um, really, like, um, you, you know, you you also um, people can't see this r right here, but you actually lost a, a limb because of yeah. this, right? Well, it was part of it. Um, the reason that I lost it in the first place was. I went on tour to South America and um, I had a diabetic ulcer on the b bottom of my foot and it looked like it had healed. Uh, I thought so, so did the doctors. And so I went on tour. We spent the first 10 days of that tour in Mexico. Uh, 
and you don't drink the water out in Mexico. Uh, you certainly don't wash in it if you've got any cuts or stuff like that. So, uh, but it got in there, and uh, it started off as an infection in my foot. So by the time we got to Ecuador, which was eleven days later, uh, we were in Quito or Quito, and I started to get a lot of pain, and. Then we went on, to, the next day we went on to Guayaquil and I could hardly walk. So I had a doctor come in, shot me full of drugs, uh, bandaged me up and stuff like that. And I did the gig. The <laughs> doctor came to the show and at every show, wherever it is, we always go out and meet the fans after the show because without the fans, we wouldn't be there. So I go out, sign stuff, take pictures, blah, blah, blah. And uh, this doctor was there and he was like, he was like looking at his watch and it got about an hour I'd spent with the kids. And uh, he said, come on, we're going. So we go to the hospital and the first thing they do is give me uh, the first operation I had. And uh, it was to see if they, here it comes. Yeah, two times. Look at that. Look at that baby. <laughs> That's beautiful. Yes, the, the union, yeah. as they call it. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, so they cut my foot open and then wrapped it up and everything. And then five days later, they took the cover off, or the bandages off. And to be quite honest, I looked at my foot and thought, you know what? I don't want that on the end of my leg anymore. That doesn't look good. And... Uh, about an hour later, they came back and said, we're, we're going to have to amputate. And I was like, kind of ready for that. So I was like, okay, fine. And uh, so they did that, and that was below knee. Uh, now, the reason that it com the, the, the diabetes complicated that was because I didn't have a great blood flow in my leg. Uh, five days after that, uh, they were moving me in the in the bed, and I, ha I just had excruciating pain in in the the stump of the below knee up. And they came in, took everything off, and it started to die. Basically, it was um, necrosis, which is a blood uh, it's not blood uh, flesh eating disease. So they had to cut cut me above knee where I had good blood flow. Uh, so that was the next operation, but. Uh, both operate or three operations I had, I was awake every time. So the first one was okay because they just cut me with uh, 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 scalpels and stuff. So that was okay. I didn't feel any of that. Uh, the next, the, the below knee operation, uh, I was obviously awake. They just gave me an epidural in my spine. And, um, but the, and the worst bit about that and the next operation where they took me above knee was um, uh, I could hear them soaring through my bones, and it wasn't it wasn't uh, it, it wasn't a bone saw which you would normally expect. You know, you'd hear the whirring and zzz, but it wasn't. It was like a hand saw, and uh, <laughs> it was. If if ever you say to yourself, oh, "I'm going to have to dig deep for this one," oh, God. Oh. I, I I was digging myself to the other side of the world. I tell you, it was it was the worst thing I have ever 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 been through. It was um, yeah, I didn't feel it. Don't get me wrong, I didn't feel it. I just heard it, and with the the when they cut through the femur, I mean, the femur's a really big boat. Right, and they got the saw stuck in it twice. I don't know if you've ever sawed any wood, you know. <laughs> and they they got it stuck in it twice, and uh, but I, like I say, I couldn't feel it. I could feel the vibrations going up my spine, and it, it was just like, oh man. And cut a long story short. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> don't cut the story that's it that's amend, it amend the story okay I'll, I'll okay i'll amend but i mean that that was it but, oh the other thing was when they cut me above knee they put a drain tube in and i had to have that cleaned and changed twice they they, they knocked me out for those 
But I'm like, what? I right. don't, I don't get it. Knocked out for that one. Yeah, I was like, I don't get it. And the only thing that I could, the only thing that I could tell that was different was the fact that uh, when I when they knocked me out, I spent an hour in uh, uh, post op, and when when they uh, they just uh, when I was awake for the ops, I was in there for twenty minutes. That's the only difference I could tell. But yeah, I got through it, and uh, but I ended up uh, many months later. I ended up with PTSD. Uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and uh, not long after that I lost my one of my brothers and that deeply affected me and uh, I ended up uh, in a really really bad place and uh, I've had to go around apologizing people for the way I behaved and uh, and, and so far everybody's been nice but i here we go. Change the story slightly. Okay. I, I fly. I fly radio controlled model airplanes. Build and fly them. And oh. I was up the airfield one day, and this guy uh, just pissed me off. And it wasn't his fault. He it, he just caught me at a bad time, and I flew at him. And uh, I saw somebody from the club said, "Look, you know, it's this guy. Can you find out who it is? Get in touch with him and tell him when he comes up the airfield." I, I want to apologize to him. And apparently that's made him feel really good because uh, it wasn't his fault. It was my fault, you know, but I ended up hitting a brick wall and, and it was a massive brick wall. Um, um, Amelia's never seen me like it. Well, nobody has. And it was, it, it was the worst place I've ever been. Uh, so <laughs> Amelia phoned the doctors and got me in the next day and said, look, you know, I think he's depressed and I think this. And this. So it was a combination of the post-traumatic stress disorder and bereavement that I ended up where I was. So, uh, but yeah, I recognize that now. And, you know, I post every so often uh, a story about, you know, what happened to me and, you know, you should talk to people and not hold it in because that just makes it worse. Talk to somebody, even if you want to talk to me, just do it, you know. And uh, the response I've had from that is is fantastic. Um, nobody's reached out yet, but hopefully they will. And I shall keep posting that, you know, at, at relevant times. Uh, just to, just to, I watched a program actually on TV about men's mental health. And it's happened to a lot of stars, uh, fo especially football stars, you know, soccer play players. And um, I, uh, I was like, that's really good. And, I, and, and it also happened to the, uh, the princes, you know, Prince William and Prince Harry. Uh, they had PTSD after, well, not PTSD, but um, uh, bereavement issues when they lost their mother. And... Uh, it was like, you know, you're really brave about talking about this. And that's what sort of got me going about uh, about putting it out there where, where I've been. So, you know, hopefully that's made a difference. Who knows? I'm sure that it has. But yeah, but that's all from, you know, losing my leg. But to be caught, you know, to, to, to sort of bring that story back and, and to put it to roost is I never, ever, ever once thought any bad you know i never cried about it i i just so positive mentally positive about the whole thing uh, whether that was hiding up what was really going on i don't know but you know every day all i had was half an hour of free internet a day so i spent 15 minutes or 20 minutes talking to my family in rotation the other time i had left was I was looking at how can I drive a car? How can I get about? How can I walk again? Da, 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 all that sort of stuff. So I was just like downloading all this stuff as quickly as I could and then read up on it later. So, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was all positivity. It still is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, you know, and, and then, you know, six months after that, after having my leg taken, uh, I was back up on stage in Germany to a, to thousands of people, and um, it was at uh, 
bang your head, I think it was. Yeah, bang, yeah open air. And the stage was in two sections, you know, uh, two levels. And I stayed on the top level until we got to the last song, See You in Hell. And then Millie came with us at that particular show. And I asked her to help me down the steps to the front of the stage so I could walk out into the crowd sort of thing on the runway. And uh, that was something else. And that was the only time I actually cried was walking out. The crowd got louder and louder and louder, got to the end and they would just go in ape shit. And that's when I lost it. I started crying and it was just like, yeah, well, this is what you wanted. This is what you got. And long may it go, you know, long may I be able to do it as long as I can. Tears of joy. So many mixed emotions. Yeah, it was. It really was. And and it just made the whole thing worth it, you know, because it wasn't it wasn't easy. There was a lot of physical training um, on machines and stuff before I had the leg. And then um, when you get the leg, it's... Uh, it takes about 35 to 40 percent more energy to walk in that leg than it than it does when you've got two. So it's a lot more. And I fall over a lot and stuff like that. Um, I'm actually waiting for all this covid shit to disappear because I've got um, uh, uh, the um, uh, amputation center have ordered me a different knee. The one I've got is manual, and, and it works fine, don't get me wrong. But it's, um, I fall over because I stub the toe a bit. And if you stub the toe, the, le- the, the actual foot from the knee downwards it isn't there anymore. So you put your weight on it, straight over. So um, I ne- I've never really hurt myself, so that's all good news as well. But um, I'm, I'm getting a, a microprocessor knee, and... Uh, like at the moment I can't walk upstairs I have to well I can that's wrong I can I can walk up and downstairs one step at a time which it does really take it out of you but um, uh, this aids you actually walking up and downstairs so that's good news but it also makes sure that the leg is always there uh, when you put your weight on it so I shouldn't have as many falls Uh, so yeah we'll see (laughs) <laughs> I don't think I'll be taking part, uh, taking part in any Olympic Games for the time being, but <laughs> or, or mosh pits, <laughs> or mosh pits, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's um, yeah. I mean, that, that was another thing, you know, when I when I first started touring, when I had uh, the prosthetic leg, I, I was not very pleasant to be around and i think that was part and parcel of the ptsd and everything and and it was because everywhere you play there are stairs Mm -hmm. whether you got stairs to get up to the venue or to get up or down to your green room and all that sort of thing and i just moaned like a bitch and it was just like do you know what every place we play are gonna have stairs so what are you doing you either want to do this so get on with it or you don't and just stop doing it. But of course I really want to carry on doing it. So I find myself in a lot of situations where I've got a, I, I have to adapt and overcome. And, and that's basically what my life is spent like, you know, um, it's like my, my flying my models. It's the, the big engines, the 50 cc's and the 70 cc's. I have to have an electric starter on them that I can control on my, transmitter because those things I, I actually started one the other day and it bit my it bit me well you can't see it now but it bruised up my elbow because i caught it on the prop and it's like uh, okay okay so that's now got an electric starter so it's like okay fine sorted so yeah it's it's just that you know and it's not just that it's it's loads of things you know uh, where we have to it's not just me it's my family as well that that have to make uh the adaptations and and uh, and they have to not do things or yeah it's because i 
for about six months, I was constantly going, you can't leave that there because I won't be able to wheel myself around. It's like the dog. We feed her with carrots. Sometimes she'll take the carrot and then dump it in the middle of the lounge floor. And it's like, I, I can't have that, you know. So I end oh, and and balls that she, she it's just like, I can't have those in, in the way. So I end up kicking everything out of the way. And it looks like I'm, you know, being an asshole, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we know that. Well, maybe I'm an asshole. I don't know. <laughs> we we know at the end of the day, you're you're a really great person, and 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 we all love you, and we think you're Thank fantastic. You. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's you know, and 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 when this goes out, you just want to say, you know, if if ever you meet me, and I am a bit of an asshole, I would say, hey, to... <laughs> Steve, don't be an asshole because I'm not. It's just you know this this PTSD and and the bereavement thing still hangs around. It's, I have to say, actually, I, I said to Millie the other day, you know what? I actually, in the last two weeks, have felt really good, um, happier and not feeling so shit as I did, you know? And so I think, I think things are, uh, you know, I'm turning the corner. So, uh, it's, it's, it's all good. I shouldn't be such, uh, I shouldn't be uh, so much of an asshole when you meet me. <laughs> Great. Uh, well, I hope you come to New York sometime. We will. It was all destined. We were destined to come there um, in, uh, would have been early September, very early September, like first or second. But uh, we, oh, obviously the tours can't, oh, postponed. But yeah. yes, that's one place we love playing. So, um Sure. Uh, the the last tour I think was for about seven weeks, so I'm hoping to to get all that, uh, you know, the seven weeks back again. So do you remember the venue in New York? Because this this show is going to be airing in New York. Yeah, as well as well as being on YouTube and worldwide. And if you are able to, you know, if you if you're satisfied with what we do and you want to put it out yep. there, that'd be awesome too. And oh, I just yeah, do, I want to do. Uh, do you know what a reset is? Have you ever heard of a reset? Okay, so a reset is basically like we're we're at this sort of like forty five minute point. So yeah. on on the TV, uh, I ha I have some really great people who are helping me out at Comcast Twenty One in Com in Carmel, New York. And um, what we what we do is they I send them everything that we do like this, and then they chop yeah. it into episodes. So like so okay. this would be like like now we do like episode two. So for, I would like to introduce to you, Mr. Steve Grimmett. From Grim Hi. Reaper, right? <laughs> Very yeah. nice to meet you, Steve. That's yeah, great to meet you too, guys. Or guy. And it, it's yeah. this. This is how people get to know me. Yeah, people. Yeah, yeah. This is how people get to know me, really, because I wouldn't be this open to fans that I meet. So this, you know, this is a good platform for them to watch. You know. Um, and and then they they might understand why I'm an asshole to them. But no, I wouldn't. I so, I'd so try hard not to. So when you feel like you're being edgy or snippy or yeah. something yeah. like this, is it low blood sugar? No, no, that's um, that's purely um, a feeling. I can't I can't really describe that to you. At all. As I eat my Nutrigrain bar. Yeah, good boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I can't really tell you. Uh, it just, it's, it wells up inside me. So I'm pretty sure it's not anything to do with diabetes. It's happened a few times, and Millie says, "Oh, I don't, check your blood sugar. I'm sure, that's what it is." But it isn't, and um, so it is definitely something to do with uh, the bereavement, the PCSD, and uh, so I try to. I don't control it. I just recognize it and then do a reset, you know? Oh. And, um, so that does definitely help, but hopefully sooner or later, it'll all be over and done with. And we'll, you know, I'll be back to, back to normal being a normal asshole. <laughs> that sounds very good. So what I'd like to do now is yep. I would like to introduce you to an album because you played in New York, right? Yes. Several times. Yes. Do you remember playing at the Chance? Yes. Poughkeepsie. Uh, Poughkeepsie, New York. Yeah. I used to play there as a kid with my band, but All right. that was a long time ago. Uh, that's where I met Dio. Right. And he gave me his home address to send him a demo. Oh, really? 
And my <laughs> grandmother cooked curry for him, and he gave it to his band. They ate it on the tour bus. Wow. That's my deal story. And I have all the signed albums in there, too, but you know what it looks like. Cool. Anyway, this is uh, Last Pharaoh. This is a band called Last yep. Pharaoh. You remember that? I have that album. I have that album. You do have this album. I do. So the lead singer, Tommy Sandangelo, I've known for about 25 years. Yeah. And he's a great heavy metal guy. And this is his band, Last Pharaoh. Yep. If everybody can uh, not go out, but pick it up or listen to it on Spotify or buy it on whatever it is, this yeah. is a great album. If you love yeah. heavy metal, like Merciful Fate from 92, like... Like in the shadows, I think it's called. Like it has that feeling because it's got the headless horseman, so it has that, you know, all that yeah. good stuff. King Diamond, uh, that that they're a great band. They they were uh, due to play with us again at, at the chance because mm -hmm. the chance was one that we were going to do again, um, and uh, they were due to play with us on that on the sure. tour that's been postponed. So they they'll probably be playing with us again. I hope so. <clears throat> Yeah, so me let's too. Give a, let's give a shout out to Last Pharaoh. Last Pharaoh. Ah! I'll see you soon. In hell. <laughs> yeah, that's right. At, at the chance. Yeah. That's great because um, I forget what else I want. Oh yeah, so just so you have an idea of like where we're situated, because uh, like this is this is a very like a very green place. Like it's very it's I don't know if you're able to see it. I'll no, I can't. No. Okay, but it's like um. This is the middle point between Poughkeepsie and New York City. Yeah. Where, where I am right now. Where okay. This place. Right. It's a town called Mayapak, New York. And right. Carmel is the next town over. And they have, a, they have a, a TV studio, a public access TV studio. And that's where we do this show. It airs on right. okay. podcast and on YouTube. Yeah. Okay. I know Carmel. I, I, I'm sure I've been there. Because as soon as you mentioned that name, I, I recognized it straight away. So... I'm sure I've been there. But yeah, like you, I'm in the country, you know, although it's we have a lot of houses around. We call those estates here. Um, uh, literally five minute walk I could be totally in the country or a two minute drive the opposite way. I'm in the country again, you know, so you're surrounded by green fields, green trees, you know. And, uh, and of course, because there's not many people out in cars and stuff like that at the moment, it's fairly quiet and we get a lot of birds around here now. It's really right. strange. I've, I've, I've become sort of green. I, uh, I've put up because we, I have a dog. Uh, we have a dog, a, uh, Alaskan Malamute and she sheds like crazy. So we have to brush her a lot. So we've got like a bird feeder full of her hair so they can build their nests or, do that sort of stuff with it. Then underneath that, I've got a, a seed, a bird seed thingy, which I made out of a, a plastic uh, bottle. Mm -hmm. And then underneath that, there's like a dog bowl, which is screwed to a boast, and that's got water in so they can have a bath and shit like that. So well, who, whoever thought I'd be like that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Metal. Yes. <laughs> bird houses. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Up the irons. Oh, uh, yeah. <sighs> so the the burning question, of course, I wanted to ask you before is, how many records did Grim Reaper sell? Do you know? I, I have no idea. I have never received a penny from any of the Reaper stuff. What? Ever. No, I know. I know. It is in the hands of a very capable... Um, uh, lawyer at the moment uh, because I've never been accounted to from anybody by anybody so I haven't received a penny so um, so that's ongoing and will be ongoing I that's should imagine for horrible. another two years that, yeah. that's a horrible loss in itself because you were signed to RCA Records a major record label and we know how many records even the first album, even the 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 see you in yeah. hell, this went platinum, did it not? It did, it did. Yep. And as well uh, as fuck you to hell, I think too. I think so. Yes, uh, fear no evil was not uh, didn't sell as well, but um, yeah. So it's it's like 
that can happen to young bands now, you know. I mean, it's it's not as good as it was in the 80s. But then, you know, these days you can earn more, you know, percentages are better because they were shit in the day. Um, but, uh, yeah, not a penny. And uh, But I am fighting for it. But it, I've, I've been doing that for 10 years. And, and every time we get to RCA or we think we're we're into getting it sorted, all of a sudden they change the, the goalposts. And it's just like, oh, you know, I, I've had to go to a lawyer three times to prove who I am. Yeah. So they'll accept Have your identity. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And, and so that's what it's like. I mean, I don't think I'm ever going to see any record royalties, but I should see publishing royalties sure. because, you, you know, they can't take any advances out of publishing royalties. So, um, yeah. So it's like, um, yeah, it's, uh, I just don't know. It could it could all end up end tomorrow or it could end, you know, in two years time, whatever. Uh, or I may be still battling with uh, RCA at that time which is why I'm telling you about RCA because you know they 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 have a legal right to give me my money but they're hanging on and I don't understand why they're hanging on either they've done something incorrect and that's why they're hanging on and they don't want us to find out and think we'll go away or um well, I don't know. I think that's what it is, you know. I think they've given somebody the money, and I've never seen it. So, I don't know. Wait, so was it a bad deal? Like, like no. were you si signing your rights away? No. Nope. I mean, you, yeah, every time you do a deal, you sign your rights away. But, you know, it was like, that, back in the 80s, it was for 50 years. Mm -hmm. Well, that got changed, and and certain things have changed since then so they have to go by those guidelines now but um yeah it's it's i just don't know i i it's one thing after another but i'm not going to give up you know i want this resolved even if it's just a full stop and no money or all my money and a full stop you know i've just it, it's strange how people think that you're a millionaire because you're a, a famous person famous band and actually it's sold but, millions of records millions. yeah yeah and i can assure you it's not that way you know i fell out with a, a brazilian uh promoter agent, agent and um you know he said oh well, i'm not i'm not uh, a millionaire like you and i'm like where do you get that idea where they do you assume, get that idea assume. yeah they assume it you know and uh yeah but uh, yeah, the the harsh reality is I haven't seen a penny from Grim Reaper, not since we got going. So yeah, there you have it, and good there, health, and good yeah. health, and Lachaim, and all of that. So I want to yep. talk about a band called Lion's Heart, which I yep. absolutely love. Yep, the musicianship in this band is like I yep. can't even I can't even measure. Yeah, yeah, that they were great songs. So it was when I first got together with the first lineup with uh, the Hours Twins. Um, that was musicianship extraordinaire, really. I've got to say, and that was a great, a great album. And I still love listening to it. Uh, we should have done an awful lot more with that, but the, the twins ended up. Well, I found out afterwards that the, the twins wouldn't play anywhere else other than their bedroom. So it was a, a pain in the arse. And whenever we did do live work, it was a pain in the arse. Um, so I ended up firing them. But uh, great, great, great songs. Well, all of the albums are great songs, I've got to say. And um, But it was always in that same vein. It was always sort of like the hard blues rock type it has it Stuff. all. It has everything. It's so yeah. good. It's so damn good. And there's two songs that really, for me, stand out. And I think you know yeah. what they are. I think you know what two songs stand out for me. Uh, well, one's got to be Portrait. That would be the third. Oh, okay. Okay, then I'm... I'm no, tell me. Because uh, I have the top three. So uh, it would be... Um, I'll start with what I feel is fantastic. Living in a Fantasy. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, of course can't believe oh 
Yeah, that Can't is a great believe who carried on. Da, da, da. <laughs> so good. I mean, the vocals, it's like, uh, it's, it's, it's like pop music, but it's great and it's heavy yeah. and it's got the guitars, which sound like, like Jakey e. Lee. It's just awesome. Yeah, it was, it was a fun time doing that. And that's ultimately what got us uh, into Japan. And uh, we ended up touring in Japan and blah, blah, blah. But um, it was, I was with uh, Tets Maru, the the um, A and R guy for for the record label, and he picked me up the day of the release. Uh, it was about twelve o'clock, something like that. And he got me. We were in the back of the car, and he said, "Steve, uh, if you sell fifteen thousand copies of of your album in Japan, it's considered a major success." And I was like, "Oh, that'd be great if we do that." That'll be fantastic. He said, well, we did that in the first hour this morning. I was like, what? Consequently, we ended up being, we went to number one in the Japanese charts, which is totally unheard of for a non-Japanese act and couldn't walk the streets without being harassed. Well, not harassed, but, you know, chased after and all that sort of stuff. And, uh, yeah, it was was something else, i got to say something else and then of course we did we we did the tours and uh, uh the tour and that was again something else bigger venues that we than we'd ever played than i've ever played you know we're talking about uh eight to ten thousand and it was just something else really really so great playing, playing in japan was really a highlight uh one of them yeah. one of them because of, obviously i'm sure playing in south america and places like the people go nuts they, they do. They're, they're very, very, very passionate about their music um, and meeting uh, the band. You know, they, they love all that, which is great because uh, we—that's what we do. Uh, but I think probably the the one that sticks out in my mind and probably will do forever and a day. We in 1987 we did a, a show called the Texas Jam. Mm-hmm. Uh, at the Dallas Cowboys Stadium, and uh, we played second. Uh, it was uh, a band called Victory, then us, then Bon Jovi. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can't remember. It might have been Night Ranger, or no, Ted Nugent, Night Ranger, Deep Purple. Uh, and a- 83,000 people. That was just like, pff, <laughs> you kidding me. Wow, where yeah. was this? That was at the Cotton Bowl in Dallas. Wow. Yeah, right here in America. In America, yeah. You had yeah, a lot of success I, in America, I would say. Sorry? You had a lot of success in America, I would say. Yeah, we have, yeah. And I still do now. I still can tour in America. You know? <laughs> um, and uh, I love playing there. I really do. I really, really love playing there. Um, and uh, I can't wait to get back out there and do it all again. It was because people appreciate it, you know, um, and they do. And I meet original fans from way, way back. We we meet new fans. We meet teenagers. Teenagers probably make up eighty percent of our our audience. How does that happen? <laughs> the, mu- the music. The music is very relatable. Yeah. You know. You know, being a 15 year old and listening to this record, you know, or the cassette tape when I bought it on cassette also, you know. Yeah. Um, And um, these songs, they they last the test of time. And the thing is, the production on the albums is a little bit different because on See You in Hell, it's a little bit more rustic. It's more of like an old fashioned approach, very analog. And then on like uh, Rock You to Hell, the production stands up today. Yeah. Like as like really high tech. I mean, you got yeah. Max Norman, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, he's uh, he's one of the few that uh, that could. Well, no. I get it. They really get it. He yeah. gets it. They do. Yeah, they know. They know all about it. They knew. He, he spent about a week with us playing the songs, going through them, changing what he thought was was a good thing to do, and then bang, away we went. Recorded. And we were there. It we put, recorded that in the states. Uh, I think we were there for about three months recording that one. 
uh, and it was major, major learning curve for us. You know, being produced by somebody, so uh, that was good. And the really production good. is super tight, super tight yep. production. Yeah, it is. Yeah, he didn't let anything go, and uh, he. <laughs> He would say to me, look, if you can reach this note, and he'll play it on a keyboard, he said, I'll let you finish early today. <laughs> I go, oh, okay. So I'd do it, and he goes, I was lying. And, that, and he has to go, oh, shit, okay. So it was it was always a full-on day. And he worked his nuts off, i got to say, you know, because he would start with me at around 11 o'clock during the day. We'd finish at 3 or 4 o'clock, um, and then we'd have dinner. And then he'd be in the studio all night with Nick doing his parts. So, you know, the guy works really hard. And uh, how many hours a day? Uh, would you say? Uh, at least 14 or 15 hours a day, at least, you know, with everybody. Um, yeah, it was good. Really, really. It was hard work because there was a lot going on. Nick did a lot of overdubs. Um and obviously he took his time with me as well. So, because one of the things he said to me when we were all sat down at dinner before we really started to work, he said, you've got a problem. And I said, what's that? He said, you're pitching. I said, what do you mean my pitching? And he said, hey, you, you're not great at pitching. And I'm like, you're talking bullshit. Anyway, it ended up that, that he was right. And I should, I should imagine the first three or four weeks, was no that's not right that's not right that's not right and he would have me come back into the control room and he'd got a uh uh i don't know what you would call it now well it would say like a guitar tuner mm -hmm. and and yeah. he would say look look it's supposed to be this and this is where it is and i'm like oh, okay so it was it was hard it was break them down build them back up again and that was the old way of doing things he did the same thing to nick because uh nick came to me and said I, I just can't work with this guy i said what do you mean what's going on he said well it, everything's wrong you know blah, blah blah and i said look nick you know this is what we wanted we wanted our music to be produced by one of the top guys you know and here you are work with him anyway we we both did it in the end and it was a worthwhile thing because after we did that album i went home and sat at a piano for six weeks pitching you know and mm -hmm. uh now i don't have that problem so uh, so so that was one thing he taught me that you know stands in good stead now because <laughs> it was a few months ago he he was gonna be doing a um uh learn how to produce sort of course and uh max norman, max norman yeah and uh, and i said to him um i'm up for it and he said, "What? What do you want to do? Do you want to be the, rec you know, the recorded band, or do you want to learn production?" I said, "I want to learn production." I said, "But if you," he said, "Well, I'm thinking about doing it in the UK too." And I said, "Right, okay, okay. If I come to the states, uh, you teach me production or what you can." And I said, "And I will. Uh, I'll be your band." For for he said, "What? You want me to give you the same old shit that I gave you in 1987?" I said, no, nah, I'm a different singer now, mate. <laughs> and it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I'd love to work with a guy again. You know, we had so much fun when we did it because it wasn't all hard work. You know, there was there was fun and games as well. But uh, he's a smashing guy. I really, really like um, Max. He's a great guy. Wonderful, wonderful. Very good. So, uh I want to talk about Beavis and Butthead. How did that come about? How did they? Did Mike Judge call you on the phone and say, "Listen, uh, Mr. Grimmett, I would love to uh, make fun of your band uh, at least three times because you are you are a three-time Beavis and Butthead Hall of Famer." Yep, yep. We we are, as far as I know, the only band to have all of their music videos on Beavis and Butthead made fun of. Yeah, and that, there is a reason for that. <laughs> He, they did the first one without us knowing, okay? okay? And we saw it, we heard about it, and then saw it. We loved it. We thought it was absolutely fantastic. And I think because it's more of a, that kind of thing that they do to, to bands is, is British sense of humour. Mm -hmm. So we thought it was fantastic. We absolutely, absolutely loved it. Yeah. So and then we met him, 
And I think he thought we were going to beat him up. Mike Judge. Yeah, yeah. And he was like, uh, duh, 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 duh. We, took, we love it. We absolutely love it. Because he's a Grim Reaper fan. Totally. And, and then he put the other ones on because he knew we liked it. And that was it. And there you go. I know. Wow. Wow. I, I'm not going to get into if it helped you sell more records because that's completely irrelevant. It is totally irrelevant. It was just being on Beavis and Butthead and uh, j- just enjoying the humour out of it. It was it was brilliant, you know, Good. and still is. I mean, that thing that the, the the show is still repeated in the UK, and it's bound to be in the states as well. Oh so, yeah. Uh, but that's a, that's another thing about the RCA. They collect all my royalties and stuff from that. So I don't see anything from that at all. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, I, hopefully I'm going to be a rich guy by the time we do get it. <laughs> well, you, you're rich in your heart. Oh, yeah. If it, does, if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. You, know? you live just... on love. You're one of the few people in, in, this, in this world, in this galaxy, that lives on love. You're, you're, yeah. You live on love. Yep, I do. And, and <laughs> again, you know, if, it's, uh, if, if there's no money... It, uh, then you know I can still do what I do, you know, for as long as I can. Anyway, uh, I will still come out and do it. Yeah, definitely. And then you had success. I would say I don't know how many times you had so many successes. It's incredible. The soup. I want to say Super Bowl, two thousand seven XLI. The Colts won versus the Bears. It was Dolphin Stadium, Miami, Florida. That's all I know about it. And. It cost, it cost approximately, this is how much this costs. I, I looked it up. For 30 seconds for an advertisement on the Super Bowl, cost it over 2 million US dollars. I think it was about four and a half. Oh, could be, right? And, yeah. 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 It was, it was some, that, again, that was something else. It, it, I started doing some work for a, for a company called The Singing Serpent. Okay. And they, let me in a little to say it was for the Super Bowl. Well, for a British guy, it sort of doesn't really mean a, a huge amount. It's like rugby. It, it, yes, it does. Yeah, and and it, it does now, mind because I do I do watch it. But um, uh, yes, yeah, so I started doing. I oh, it's two or three songs for them, and uh, that was a, a big payday for me. Just doing the work for them. Ah, good. And then. Uh, happened next um i can't i think they put their song in with me singing and the guy from the guys from the art department of of um uh garmin said uh who's the guy singing oh that's uh steve grimmett god that's the guy we wanted in the first place you know and they'd used um justin hawkins from the darkness and they didn't like it they had uh, glenn hughes and they didn't like that either wow. and then they said can you do our song so the next day i was driven down to london to air studios to do their song for them mm-hmm. did the song and that was it it was all done and dusted and i had a payday you you couldn't have wished for it was <laughs> fantastic the song and, itself is like two and a half minutes, so that's yeah. that's five five times how many millions they they had yeah. to pay out for this. I'm sure. Yeah, and they uh, uh, and then I think it was about ten days later I got a call. Can you come down to London again? So we're we're recording the video for it. And I was right. like, oh okay. Why do you want me? Well, because we're going to do band situation. I was like, oh okay. So I went down. And you've seen the video, obviously. So I did that part. Yeah. And then uh, uh, then my other claim to fame in that video, there's a helicopter. You might want to watch this. <laughs> at, at the very end. And that was me flying that helicopter. Wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, I, and I said, why do you come over here to do that stuff? You know, he said, well, because it's easier with, with uh, working with the unions in the States. It's a real pain in the backside. He said, but. You know, we come over here, we get exactly what we want with no hassle, blah, 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 blah. And it was, it was, uh, it was great. It was a great three or four days, you know, it was awesome. That is and then awesome. I get to, I got, I got to meet them all. 
um, all the guys from uh, uh, Garmin. And, and their, their thing at the time was that they had uh, sat nav, but nobody really took them seriously. So that's why this was all done. And it's a, a very small amount of money compared to what they make because they, they do a lot of work for, for the military. So, uh, yeah, but now they're one of the top sat nav people. Uh, so it's great. Incredible. Worked. Yeah. Absolutely. Wow, that's, that's really great. Um, okay, so I want to ask you, what is true metal? What does that mean? I don't know. Because don't people, know. Say, people say keep it true. What does that mean? Keep it double guitar harmonies? uh you know soaring vocals keep it true i don't know i honestly do not know it's like being labeled as new wave of british heavy metal which we are what does that mean and it and it's like you know we got labeled that when we would tour in the states and you know we used to have a discussion nick and i was like well what does it mean you know what what is it and i think what it is is people have to pigeonhole stuff so they can right. say this band is this this band is that Metallica are this, uh, uh, Iron Maiden are this, so they can, they, they have to pigeonhole it so they know what they're talking about, and then they can place other bands in those, in those genres. You know, mm -hmm. um, we we've we've had heavy rock to heavy metal, new wave of British heavy metal, and and it's just like, well, no, we're Grim Reaper. Simple. Yeah, I mean, I think when people say keep it true, you know, uh, people want it. It's like heavy metal music that is sort of um, refined down to like a very classic feeling that a person gets when they hear it because it's got the double guitars, the yeah. harmonies, and um, yeah. But yeah, that's that's good that that's good that you say that because you're you're a much more open person. It's not just a subgenre. There's so much more. Oh yeah, absolutely, and 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 I don't mind being labelled, um, but it, it, we've never done it. We've never seen ourselves as new wave of British heavy metal or heavy metal or heavy rock. Or it, it's just we're just Grim Reaper, and it's it, you know that's the stuff that we play. If somebody says Grim Reaper, you know what you're getting, and uh, yes. you know that's as far as I I would take it, but. You know, other people are other people. So, uh, here I have three albums on vinyl of Grim Reaper, but there's supposed yep. to be a fourth one. There was a fourth. Well, no, oh, there, there wasn't a fourth one. No, oh. there isn't. No. Uh, we demoed up a lot of songs. Um, and at the time, uh, these were written with other people. I, I, I didn't have anything to do with the writing. And I think that's when the rest of the band decided that, you know what, it's this ain't good. It's not Grim Reaper. It's not what people are expecting. Uh, yes, OK, you could change. But this was just like a, an, an AOR version. And it was just like, no, nah, this ain't going to work for me. And uh, uh, RCA took Nick over to the States and they wrote the album under a name under the name barfly but it never got released mm. um and uh i glad it didn't somebody's put it out recently actually on youtube but we've uh, uh, we've made sure it's been taken off because it's yes it's me singing but it they're not our songs and it doesn't sound like grim reaper at all um that basically the fourth and the fifth albums were steve grimmett's grim reaper where you have uh the uh walking in the shadows which was very grim reaper and we kept it like that because we thought we ought to ease people into the fact that this isn't grim reaper but this is where it comes from and then the next album we can let go a bit more uh which we did with um at the gates and uh um so there is no fourth grim reaper album we attempted to write one but it just didn't work out. It wasn't in the yeah. No. Because and and, at that time, we were being pulled apart by the label. Uh, we, we wrote an album, uh, the, the, the last album, and then 
the label came to us and said, look, you know, we want you to change how you write it. We want it AOR style. Uh, we want it a li little bit more uh, radio friendly because um, radio wasn't playing heavy rock anymore, heavy metal. So we changed that. And then all of a sudden, Appetite of Destruction uh, made a comeback. And uh, um, that's when they came to us and said, uh, go back to writing Green Reaper stuff. So that's why there was a big gap between the second and the last album. And uh, and then I think they wanted us to do it all again. And and it was RCA that, that got uh, the, these, the writing teams in and it just didn't work. Wow, wow. Uh, because I know there was a video that Nick Bocott had um, made for you, actually. I, I, I hope that you saw it, where he's, he's actually addressing you, and he says, let's do this fourth album, uh, nothing, absolutely nothing to do with hell or something like this. Yep. But I won't do that. And, and the reason I won't do that is because <clears throat> it's got to be something that's done between us, not... not uh, uh, not somebody else's vision, and then I'm there because uh, yeah, as a uh, because uh, as a singer, I'm not I'm not doing that, and I won't do that. I've told him that. Um, I'm very very busy with a lot of things at the moment, so I can't do it for at least the next couple of years, at least. And uh, you don't call me up on Facebook and do that. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. You do that privately. You know, but, but he's a funny guy. It's his sense of humor. Yeah, it might be, but it, I didn't take it that way that particular time. You know, don't get me wrong. Nick and I get on really well, and we were a pair of uh, ass wipes together. You know, we, we, the we were terrible. McCartney, the Lennon McCartney, the Len McCartney of of British heavy metal. Yeah, <laughs> you could say that. Yeah, but yeah, I I I will do another one with him. I I definitely will. But we need to sit down and talk. You know, I mean, you know, he want he said, oh, I've got a label that would do it well. I won't do it with that label because I approached that label to do the Steve Grimmett stuff and I didn't get a reply. So it was like, well, okay, so you don't want to know me then, but if Nick's in it, you do. But I, so it won't be see you by, uh, you well, won't get it. However it works out, I know that yep. the, fan, the fans and myself included would be so happy to hear you and Nick Bocott coming up with yep. new yep. Reaper material. Yeah, it's, and it, it's, it, it, might be on the cards we need it. At, at the end of the day um it has to be from both of us not just one of us so um you know we, nick and i really need to sit down and talk about it uh, and i need to let him know how i feel about things so that's what will happen but uh yeah yeah i'd like to work with nick again um Certain things have come out of, of us doing these uh, these lockdown tapes. And uh, I, I, so I will be working with him again. And I'll, I can't say any more on that, but I will be working with him again and uh, look out for that because that's going to be a special project coming up. We're going to be looking out for that. For yeah. Sure, yeah. for sure, yeah. definitely. Yeah. I, I, can't, I can't say anything because he's asked me not to. Uh, but um, yeah, something something is definitely going to happen. So uh, towards the end of this year, I hope. Yes, uh, yes, yes, yeah, yes, yes. it'll be good. It'll be definitely good. But yeah, so good. Okay, so I, I'll I'll wrap it up because we're coming. Okay, to sure. Time. Uh, there's oh god, so many. I'm sure there's a, a million things that I want to ask you, but um, that's so great. Um, if that happens as as well, and. Oh, what? There was a band called Onslaught. Yes. And I went on Spotify, and there's so many albums that I didn't know which ones you were singing on. It. I'm on uh, In Search of Sanity. By Onslaught. Yeah, that was okay. their that was their um, biggest seller ever. Um, it was when they changed their fr from being a sort of like death metal band to. Uh, to a, a more mainstream uh, hard rock metal, if you like. Um, and I, I just finished with Grim Reaper at all turned tits up. And um, 
I got a phone call from their manager to say, look, you know, uh, are you up for doing this? And I said, well, let, let me have the tapes. Let, let me have the songs and I'll see what I can do. So I actually recorded it in, in my uh, garage on a four track recorder. And uh, um, I sent it off to them. And uh, the, apparently they all got in uh, Steve, the drummer's uh, car and started to listen to it, and they were just, like, blown away. Mm. And, well, I think it was about two weeks after, I was in New York re-recording all the album vocals because they'd fired Cy, uh, the, the, the original singer, which is such a shame. But, um, uh, yeah, it was uh, a total departure from me uh, and what I, did, what I normally did. But it was another stepping stone. You know, I'd... I used it. I liked doing it. I liked the guys um, and enjoyed doing what we did. Uh, but it was a stepping stone for me because they were more European based and, and I had never played in Europe. So it was like it was a stepping stone for me. Did that. We did. We did several tours of, of Europe and. Um, yeah, it was good. I can't really. uh poo poo any of it really it was quite it was quite good uh and i still you know steve is actually steve the drummer uh now drums for me at the moment as well so it's all uh and, and we did another album and one you probably don't know about or uh, uh myself steve grice the drummer the, the original drummer um uh jace oh, i forget his surname and al johnson we all got to together to do uh, an ex onslaught thing we actually went out and did um uh, the songs from uh in search of sanity we called ourselves the sanity days and uh, I then we did the, I, I have that i have the sanity days as well yes. yeah and uh, we well, basically yeah. then came up <clears throat> came up with a an album as well mm -hmm. so uh yeah that was good too that was great that was good, and and it was great. I'd never met uh, Jay Stallard is the bass player, sorry, and uh, I I'd, I'd never met those two guys. I'd only known Steve, so it was all it was all fresh and it was all really cool. You know? It was great, and we all got on really really well. I still get on with those guys too, and uh, unfortunately we didn't get to tour the album because um, Al, the guitarist, he got um, prostate. No, not prostate. Uh, uh bladder cancer and it really screwed him up and i mean he hasn't picked up a guitar for about four years now i think so um yeah that was a, a real shame and it was right at the time of the release as well so we couldn't tour it but you know you never know you never know what happens but um yeah that was good that was a good crack that was nice 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 there's a band called grimstein yeah that's that's uh steve stein and myself two yeah. steves yeah two steves i met steve many many years ago he used to play in a uh covers band and i saw him playing in minnesota and uh i just loved his playing he was so fluid and it was just the easiest thing in the world for him to play a guitar it was brilliant and uh i saw him afterwards at the bar and i said hey, I said, I've got to say, your playing is fantastic. I said, but I want to do an album with you. And he was stoked to do it. He's never done one. So we did, uh, we, we did uh, Grimstein, the, the album. And uh, we have another one in the bucket ready to re-record. So we're mm. going to do that in the next couple of months as well. So, nice. uh, yeah, that's going to be really cool. Yeah, but, yeah. Yeah. And, and and the songwriting with uh, with Steve is just like so easy, you know. He'll send me a song, and it's just he says, "Look, you have permission to do anything you want with it. Change it, do this, do that." So okay, fine. So I end up hashing it up, and we end up with these with these fantastic songs. And I love playing with Steve. I really do. He's actually replaced a, a guitarist halfway through a tour. Uh, a Grim Reaper or Steve Grimmett's Grim Reaper uh, tour for me, um, and he's a lovely guy. But what a what a fantastic guitarist he really is! You know, he's uh, he's what I call got it. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's something called the Steve Grimmett Band. Yes. Does that still exist? Um, no. No, that was, we, we wrote one album um, uh, called Personal Crisis. And uh, that, I don't know why we ended up doing that, but um, it was, uh, it was, a, it was, I tell you what, it was a great album and I really, really enjoyed doing it. I really liked the way it sounded, mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. And it fell through the cracks and it is such a shame. Uh, my label have recently taken it on again, so I doubt very much whether it will do anything. But you know, they uh, they're, they're doing it. But it was a great album, good, uh, you know. But we'll see. I recorded the uh, 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 vocals in Germany uh, with uh, Dennis Ward. He he actually oh, produced that, that album. Was that in Stuttgart? Yeah. I lived very close to Stuttgart for many years. Oh, really? I lived in Tübingen, and I used to go to Ballingen uh, for right. rehearsals with some of the bands I was playing in. Yeah. All right, yeah. Oh, that place. Yeah. Yeah, stayed at his place for a week, did the vocals, um, and uh, and then he mixed it. So, yeah, it was, uh, that was a nice, uh, good album as well. Um but that did really slip through the cracks. We gave that to A&R, A- AOR Metal and they just didn't do anything with it. And it's such a shame because uh, that really excited me uh, that when I heard it. I was like, oh, you've got to be kidding me. This sounds great. You know? But yeah. hey-ho, such well, is life. It didn't slip through the cracks completely because I was able to find it on yeah. Spotify. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, you, I, I dare say, if you look hard enough, you'll find it. But it's, you know, it didn't do anything. It didn't sell. So, uh, and that's why I mean, you know, by slipping through the cracks, really. But well, nowadays nothing sells. No, exactly, exactly. Right. You don't it's make money out of it's albums. Right. Yeah, that's true. That's true. you don't. We only do it for the love. I do, yeah, I do do it for the love, uh, and, and you know, waiting for the reaction of of our fans to see what they think of it, which is really cool. Uh, and also, uh, when you do, uh, when they do reviews and stuff, I mean, the last two Steve Grimmett's Grim Reaper albums, I've not had a bad review out of both albums, which is so unreal. Well, uh, you're beloved. You're, 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 you're beloved because, mm-hmm. you know, even if you think that, that you may have snippy times and this and that, like at the end of the day, the people really love you. Yep. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really it's good. It's yeah, really it true. Is, yeah. They accept you. They understand mm. you. Okay, he's not going to be in a good mood all the time, but he's a human. <laughs> being. He's a human yeah. being. Let him live. Let the yeah. man live. Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> okay. So last question is basically for sessions. If 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 I recorded some songs and I said I really want to have Steve Grimmett sing on it, how do we go about doing that? How does that happen? Get in touch. Uh, I don't do it for nothing, I've got to say, but because uh, that's part of my living. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> so get in touch with me and say, look, you know, would you be up for it? Uh, then I'll reply, say, um, yes, I- I- I'm up for it. I want to hear the song. Send me a song with your lyrics and your, vo- your vocal ideas, and then I will take it away and do what I do. Definitely. Do what I do best on it and then I- send it back yeah. to you. I feel like Columbo, you know, Columbo's like, no, no, you know, so, sorry, one more thing, one more thing. Uh, there was uh, there, there, one one funny thing. Um, I was going to ask you about the kilt. Yep. That's uh, different, which is, is it... what I like about it. But mm-hmm. it's, it's also easier for me because I have to wear, I don't have to, I, I use in-ear monitors and I use a uh, wireless headset Mm -hmm. it's most of them come with pockets in the side uh because i wear gillies uh kilts and they're like a work kilt so they've got pockets in the side i can drop the transmitters it transmitters and receivers in there yeah? yeah but also it's just so much easier when i'm wearing my prosthetic leg uh to walk around in that and be unhindered by uh trousers or pants and i it's um it's just much easier much much better yeah yeah 
So I've got I've got quite a collection of those now. <laughs> Hot sauce. Yes. <laughs> that's still in that's still in um not production. That the idea is there and it will be done soon. We I I'm in touch with a company called Grim Reaper Foods and that's how it all, this all happened. Mm -hmm. And I've met the guy several times. Um it's it's all down to me and having time to say right i'm coming down let's do this and i i need to choose my labels because they're going to print all the labels up for me and um uh, and then it'll be right now i need to get it on uh the internet and start selling the stuff and the best ways to i need to know the best ways from them how to ship it out and stuff like that because a lot of it is going to be in glass bottles because it has to be. Uh, you you cannot put um, like Reaper chilies in uh, plastic. Apparently, right. It will it will uh, melt it will melt through or something like. I don't know. Right. I don't know. So, but, yeah. So yeah. what I'd like to know is if you if you have a habanero uh, assortment of this hot pepper sauce, which I I yeah. love hot pepper sauce. I mean, yeah. I'm half Trinidadian, so it's like right. uh, in, in my blood. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, if it's if there's a way to ship it to the U.S., will you be doing that? Yes, absolutely. I mean, it, you know, I don't intend just to because uh, us, us British do like uh, uh, hot sauce and stuff, but nowhere near as much as you guys in the States. So, you know, we'll be looking at, at shipping it to South and North America, really. Uh, but, uh, yes, I am going to do that. And I'm glad you brought that up because it's something I, I really need to start doing because I'm really good friends with uh, Ripper Owens. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's just come out with a, a, a coffee range, which I thought was really smart. So mm -hmm. uh, it's like, oh, yeah, well, we talked about this on the Three Tremors tour. And uh, uh, I don't know if you, don't, you know, do you know who the Three Tremors are? Yeah. Well, the Three I, Tremors were originally Ronnie James Dio, Bruce Dickinson, and Rob yeah. Halford. Yeah, well, but they didn't do it, did they? And it had uh, to do with the management of Dio. They didn't. Uh, yeah. Bruce didn't want to deal with Wendy Dio. That was it. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, um, I, um, they they were doing a, a European tour, and uh, oh, what's his name? Oh, I'm terrible with bloody what's, names. What's the band? What's the band? Uh, it was Sean Peck, Ripper Owens, and uh, oh, the tyrant. Oh, I, I stir. Harry, Harry. Oh, not I stir. Anyway, no, 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 no. It was uh, it was the guys from Cage actually that did okay. that did the backing. But anyway, okay. Uh, Harry couldn't make it, and uh, he the reason he couldn't make it because he'd married a girl in Greece. And he was stuck in he was stuck in Greece or something like that, and he couldn't make it out of of no. He'd overstayed his welcome in Greece. He had to go home to the states, and he wasn't allowed to leave there for ninety days. Mm -hmm. So we ended up doing the. Um, they asked me if I'd do the tour, so I did do the tour, mm -hmm. uh, European tour, uh, which was great. It was something else. Um, it was very hectic because I ended up doing. Um, learning the songs over eight days, not knowing which parts were um, Harry Cronklin is his name. He's the singer for Jack Panzer. Yeah. Uh, so nice. it gave me eight days um, to learn the songs, but I didn't know what parts he was doing. So the very first night uh, I had to go through all that with uh, Sean and, uh, and, he had to tell me what parts I was singing. I was like, oh, okay, right, okay. So it took me a couple of days to to really get on it, but got it, got on it, and uh, it was great. It was awesome. Yeah, great guys, wow. great, great guys. It was awesome. Yeah, but that's how I know Tim. Well, I know, I know, I met Tim in Peru ages ago, and uh, um, we ended up uh, having a little talk and stuff. But then, uh, you know, I. Met, I've met him again on this tour and we got on like house on fire. So uh, he's a really good friend of mine. And uh, yeah, it's good. What is plastic head distribution? That is a, it's exactly what it says. It's It's been going since the very, very early 80s. They distribute um, uh, stuff, stuff, records all over the world. 
and um, it's quite a quite a big uh, conglomerate. Yeah, they do all sorts now. T-shirts, so that they they get them into uh, like Walmart and stuff like that. Like that. But, um, they do all sorts of things, and uh, but then then they have their subsidiary labels, and uh, uh, we are on two of them. Back to Black, which is the vinyl side of of uh, Dissonance Records, and then Dissonance Records we are on as a, a CD. You know, our CDs are released on Dissonance, but they're they're a big concern. You know, they're they're probably one of the biggest um, uh, independent labels. In the world, I'd say, and uh, you know their their track record speaks for itself. They've been doing it from the eighties, you know. So, and they're still doing it, and they're still doing it strong, and it's massive. You know, right. I've been, I've had a good look around their setup, and uh, there's four, I think, four massive uh, warehouses that they do, and that's I've got my own recording studio. And uh, my recording studio is in a building at the back of their main building. And uh, that's where where I do. Sorry? That's where you do your work. Yeah, that's where I do my studio work. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and at home. You can see behind me. What program do you use? Is that Pro Tools or Cubase? Cubase. Great, great program. Yeah, fantastic. I've tried tried, uh, Pro Tools. I just can't get on with it. And uh, so Cubase, that's the very latest version of Cubase. Uh, then I use all, all sorts of tools to help me out, you know, because I do I do recording, mixing, and uh, mastering. So and I've got all that sort of stuff. And you do all that yourself. Yeah. yeah. You learned it from Max Norman. I learned it from everywhere I've been, basically. Wow. And then a lot of it, because people say, "Well, how do you learn a program like this?" And it's just like, well, what it is is you have to sit down and learn the program. You know, and I've got Cubase, but I only probably know 50% of what Cubase does. You know? And unless you try things, you'll never learn. You'll never learn. I tried something today, uh, which was uh, uh, a timing part of the program, and it picked this the timing up is incredibly well. And it's uh, another another shield to my armor. You know. So, yeah, it's like, yeah, really good. Um, yeah, I enjoy it. I enjoy enjoy the the challenges that it all brings. You know, especially when you're dealing with another band, mm-hmm. because they, uh, you know, they're they're different, and you have to treat them all different. You can, and I don't think that I I I'm not the sort of person that puts my sound to their band. I don't like that, and and so. You know, I'm always trying to create what they sound like. But uh, so good. How can we support you? How how can we help Steve Grimmett survive musically and everything? Come to my shows and buy my records. <laughs> buy merch. Too. Do you have yeah, merch? merch? Yeah, we do. We have. We are actually getting a little low on merch. Actually, in my uh, website page but i'm gonna be doing more stuff with that shirt fairly shortly gonna start making a few of my own shirts for that particular uh, you know just for that um you know they won't be on tour or anything like that you know so i try to be different or try to have different designs for every tour we do so uh and these will be different because there'll be stuff that you can only buy from my merchandise page um, uh, there's buttons there's patches several different types there's uh, uh t-shirts old tour t-shirts and stuff like that but yeah what's the website where can people get it it's uh grim reaper official uh dot uk got it steve grimmett thank you so much i i don't this has been unbelievable and i really hope that people enjoyed i hope that you enjoyed it i hope you had I laughs yeah uh, i did you know. and it, this this is you haven't been really you've let me go you know you've taken my leash off and away you've gone so, and i like that kind of interview and you'll probably get more out of me than just asking me questions one after the other after the other you know i mean just slipping them in like you did that's great you know i enjoy, I enjoy this kind of 
uh, interview. So, yeah, thank you. You're an artist. I'd love to let you flow. Awesome. <laughs> Wish you all the best. All the best to, to Millie. And you, you, you're fantastic. What a great unit. And we hope to see the fourth official Grim Reaper album in the future. Cool. Excellent. <laughs> Thanks, bud. Uh, Going to say in closing, thank you so much. Thank you very much. And I'd, I'd just like to add, you know, thank you to, to my fans uh, for all your love and support. Keep doing it. Uh, I will keep coming out there. So, you know, uh, I know this tour in the States got postponed, but it is only postponed. It will take uh, uh, place again. Uh, but thank you for all your support because without you, I wouldn't be doing it. Thank you very much. We love you, Steve. Thank you. Love you guys too. Namaste. Take care. <laughs> Take care, man. All the best. Take care. And you. Take care, See buddy. You. Bye. Bye. Bye.